Does that make sense? Oh yeah. No, I'm I'm like noting this, you know, I, I should write this down or something. Well, you got it on video. Hello and welcome back to Collegiate Pickleball Tailgate Summer Series with the CEO. I'm your host, Elliot Rothstein with the Tundra. And today I'm incredibly fortunate to have Patrick Rolfus with me here today. He is the co-founder of The Hub and president of Pickleball Superstore. He's also got his hand in the pickleball sector everywhere you can find it. Pat, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Elliot. Thanks for having me. This is kind of fun. Awesome. Sweet. And then before we, obviously I want to hear about like your business end, that's the real stuff, but I want to first hear sort of how you found out about pickleball, how you got into the community and sort of felt like you might want to get into the business side. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, short and sweet. My, my father-in-law um, came out to visit us um, uh, from Texas. We live in California and I came home from uh, work one day. I was uh, at another company for 35 years. And I said, honey, where's your dad? And said, oh, he went to the desert. Well, 79-year-old men go to Palm Springs and, you know, hang out in the desert. And um, he came back the next day and he had a silver medal. And I'm like, silver medal? Like from what? And he goes, you know, yeah, pickleball. And I go, well, what's pickleball? Yeah, I went to the Nationals at pickleball. I'm a silver medalist. And I'm like, well, that's what is that? And so that was in um, 2017. Right then we, uh, you know, YouTubed it and and I went to Amazon and bought paddles. And then he said, oh, and by the way, there's a tennis club across the street that has four courts and lights. So my wife and I joined it and bought paddles on Amazon like everybody does. And we would walk across the street and we would they turn the lights on. We'd play singles. We'd leave. They shut the lights off, and we'd walk home, basically. And that was our entree into the sport. Um, obviously, it was fun. I mean, fell in love with it, and um, we started um, basically traveling and playing tournaments. And you know, it was like a, a new life for me, as you know, as I'm an older, uh, not not like you, Elliot. I'm an old man. And uh, so it was fun to compete again and do something with my wife. And I was kind of going down a little semi-retirement path. And um, I started helping that club by building more courts. And I ended up building a restaurant there and um, doing uh, all the events there. We ran big tournaments with like the PPA and the golden ticket with USA Pickleball and huge stuff, you know, from, you know, 2020 and beyond and then um that was that was the intro to to our pickleball you know story and you know grew the club to about 2000 members and i didn't own the club um and then from there i bought land uh, in uh san diego and with my partners and we built uh the hub and the brand and we have three very large scale operating clubs today and building our fourth in jacksonville florida so we're, we're excited about that. Sweet. Yeah. I mean, it's very clear that, you know, pickleball started out as a family thing, but you have a very just sort of natural entrepreneurial spirit, sort of, or like a, maybe a colleague, you know, because you, you were a business person far before getting into pickleball. Um, do you maybe want to talk a little bit about that and maybe how that differs from the pickleball side of things now? Well, sure. Yeah. So you know, as a college student, I'm sure, you know, I don't know if you'll appreciate this or not, but um, I've never actually put a resume together. Um, I've never actually worked for anyone or gotten a job. So uh, right out of school, I um, invented a bottled water coffee maker where you take a five gallon uh, bottle of water and you invert it. You press the button, you get bottled water coffee. And I was 23, 23 at the time and young and dumb and started a company and went around and was sold to, well <laughs> anyway sold it to water companies and started a manufacturing company and 
built that company up over 35 years to, you know, bend steel and mold plastics and make electronic controls. And that got into packaging of coffee and teas and had uh, 24 patents and, um, you know, 250 employees towards the end. And, uh, you know, basically it was been a great company, raised my family on it. And that was my main business. I, I started many other businesses along the way, as most entrepreneurs do. Um, but that was the, the, the crux of it, the main business, and started to basically sell off pieces of it because I was completely vertically integrated. And um, in 2017, 18, and that's when we found Pickleball and and the idea that I was going to go down this quote unquote semi retirement path, my wife will tell you and joke about it. Like she knew that was never going to happen. So as soon as I found pickleball, um, especially seems like a long time ago, but um, I feel like a grandfather in this industry, but it's just an entrepreneur's playground, right? So there's just, there was a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things, but, um, but yeah. So, you know, once I got into it, then I just saw all these opportunities of, where you can, you know, grow businesses and, and where the needs were and, and solve problems. And, and then I started starting other companies within that space as well. Sweet. And you, you said you started it when you were 23 and that 23. And that's that's pretty much what you went. You were really good at it and you just took it off from there. And that was what you did for a living. If, if to other 23 year olds or people in college or right out of college, maybe they have a good idea or they want to innovate or do something, but they're sort of not able to convince themselves to fully commit and go for it and make their vision a reality. Do you have any advice or, or words of encouragement for those people? Well, sure. <clears throat> First of all, in my case, um, you know, I'm the youngest of five. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, if I fail, I'm failing at 23. So I don't have a lot of, a lot of risk personally. Um, you know, the next was I had in my immediate family, we had 17 people that I knew would love me no matter what I did, fail or not. So, and I came from a family of entrepreneurs. So, um, uh, you know, the the older you get in life, the more complicated your life becomes, the, the more, um, you know, things that you have to you know, do and afford and everything else. It's a lot easier in hindsight to it all. It's a lot easier to take those risks when you're younger. It's easier to fail when you're in your early 20s. It just is. I mean, all you really need to do is cover rent and car payment and food, right? So, you know, that's the time to take the, in my opinion, to take those risks and everything else. Now it's, it's hard because you don't necessarily have the experiences either. But the other advice that I would get is just, you know, most of most of the success and the people that you talk to, it's all about perseverance. It's all about just keep grinding, keep doing it, keep your belief, keep your your core, listen to others at some level, but you know, follow your gut and um and keep going. It, it's it's hard, it's not easy, but you know, if you like it and the rewards are there, it, it makes sense. It took me about five years until the company re- really became profitable, my first company. And um, and I have all the stories, Elliot. I, I sold my car once to make payroll. I, I you know, <laughs> just, you know, really, you know, all the, all the stories, like, you know, just worked, you know, seven days a week and just worked hard and believed in it. And, you know, again, I, I say I'm not that smart because I just, you know, I kept grinding just thinking, I, I will get it done. I, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to fail. Um, not that failure is necessarily a bad thing either. You know, you can learn from that. But, but that's was my path. And my only advice to you know people at your age would be, if you want to do this, the earlier the better. Uh, there is no better time than when you're young and um, and you have the energy and you have just you don't have a lot to risk. Now, for me, I mean, well, now my my three children are grown and out of college and and everything else but um there's just a lot more to risk um you know and, and during that time when i was raising my children and had a mortgage and my wife and you know everything else there's just a lot more to risk I and mean, unfortunately my company was up and running so that's my advice if you're going to do it I, i'd start early absolutely yeah that was that was really really insightful thank you so much
yeah you know, you know take advantage of your youth years and be ready to you know have to persevere how to work have to work through things had recently they held the first world pickleball convention and you were brought in as one of the influential people in the space um as a speaker um what were some of the developments or like talking points that really came out of the convention that that you were around and you heard yeah um it was great i mean the industry as a whole is still very um, new and growing. Um, a, lot, a lot of passionate people uh, are in the space. A lot of an entre entrepreneurs are in the space. Um, so it, it's fun to see this much passion and and see what's happening in it. Um, you know, there were some really good speakers, some friends of mine that spoke, some some people that I uh, have known and respect. So that was great. Um, there's anywhere from, you know, what's happening in the club space with franchisees and, and franchisors and different brands to um, the pro level to uh, what's happening in the paddle space with, you know, regulations and USA pickleball and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it was, it was worthwhile for sure. And um, you know, it was nice to be invited, nice to see and nice to bring some insights. My, my particular topic, which I felt was interesting was, yeah. um was uh basically how the pros how the pro pickleball space um you know wh where do you see that going and everything else and i tried to relate it to business as much as i own a little bit of major league pickleball i also own a little bit of duper very very small percentages of each but um but i related the pros basically and the opportunity from the business side of the equation of how a company like pickleball superstore um, how we utilize pros. Like we just brought Tyson McGuffin on, on our cap table to utilize him to, to basically as one of the face of the, of the company. Um, so people can relate to Tyson. They want to aspire to be like Tyson and, you know, and, the, and which justifies, or, you know, they look towards Skecher shoes, for example, or Yola paddles, for example, because those are Tyson's brands. So, that's how I was relating the pros in my particular case to back to business. Um, the business of being a pro is um, fun and there's opportunities for the people that have the ability to do it. it, it that's a super tough road as well. Um, but yeah, as from the conference goes, super interesting. And, you know, and back to, you know, you know failing young, <laughs> there is a lot of, people out there trying to do things that if I had my, you know, if they asked me well, what's the chance of success of this guy or this company succeeding, not that I know all the answers, I certainly don't, I would say that pretty low, but, but, you know, because there's, it's still a young industry in this particular case. And, and uh, there's just a lot of people trying a lot of things. So, so it's fun to see it. Yeah. And right now we're still on that sort of really come up phase. Um, but I, the, the plateau has to come at, at some point, right? Do you, I don't know, have any ideas of when you might expect that? Or is there anything you've been doing to try and prepare for something like that? Well, um, I think we're really far off on the plateau, personally. Got Got I, I, I think we are just still at the tip of the iceberg to the whole thing. I mean, look at the college, you know, the market, which I'm very, very bullish on, very excited for, you know, all the college players that are coming here in San Diego, for example, at our San Diego hub, we are the home of the San Diego State Aztec Pickleball Club. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we sponsor them and, you know, they come in here and they practice and it's super excited about it. And we're going to do the same at all the hubs and, and, um, you know, really support the collegiate effort. But, but that's a phenomenon that, quite frankly, wasn't around two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just the tip of the iceberg. And from a collegiate sport, now you're seeing this influx of, you know, your age, you know, peers, you know, really getting into the pickleball side. And and, and we're just very bullish. And, and with Pickleball Superstore as well, we have programs around it where we really support the collegiate effort. And so the hub here in San Diego we are the home of the San Diego State Aztecs. Um, so we give them a practice facility, jerseys, you know, the whole thing. It's, you know, to really help them build their club and, and everything else. 
Um, so the growth in that particular you know market that didn't exist two years ago for pickleball and and you Elliot I gotta believe as a collegiate player um, you know your cycle you're probably thinking you'll play this sport 50 years from now I'm assuming or how long do you think you'll play the sport I mean I hope the rest of my life yeah yeah and that's the beauty of the sport right so so when you say where's the sport gonna plateau I think it's a a long ways off from the collegiate side, especially, you know, we're seeing um, really good community growing, right? So we're seeing that, you know, the gathering of uh, students in a healthy environment, the social aspect and, you know, competition um, from, you know, at a high level, but also from a friendly level and just social aspects. So so there's this is where the beauty of pickleball really starts to come in, and that's why I really live it at, at the collegiate level. I think there's going to be more and more opportunities. You're seeing the APP, you know, have a full collegiate series. You're seeing Duper have one. You're seeing the national, um, you know, pickleball. I forgot the name of it, but we hosted actually, um, you know, have a collegiate program. So there's more and more of it um, at Pickleball Superstore to help these clubs we give them the ability to basically raise money through the store and get a percentage of the revenue um, through Pickleball Superstore. So that helps fund these these colleges and these clubs to, so they can travel the tournaments and, and do all things. So that whole side of it is super exciting um, just because I think that's part of the growth of the sport. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called Benjamin Button. It's with... Um, my favorite actor, actually, Brad Pitt, but um, where basically he's, he's born an old man and then he, as he grows up, he gets younger and younger, essentially. It's a funny, fantastic movie. But, you know, this sport has been equated to that, where basically it started, you know, with old people like myself and then it's getting younger and younger. And, and now you're seeing, you know, people your age and the collegiate level and younger start to play the sport. So the opportunity and where the sport plateaus I don't even think we're close. Um, I think it's you know going to continue to accelerate, and there'll be more and more opportunities in it, and and you know which is better for everybody, quite frankly. Yeah, I I totally agree, and especially on the the age demographic, the the shift is is very real. I think um, according to this, I believe it was Pickleheads.com um, that on the, about thirty percent of players now are eighteen to thirty four. Um, so there's 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 a, still a lot to expand with like the college age because there aren't courts at like most universities at, for the Michigan team. We 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 travel like we take a 20 minute car ride um, to get to like the nearest facility that's indoors to play. Um, and I'm even even thinking, obviously, the competitive scene for collegiate that's going to go a long way, um, a potential like. I guess partnership with the NCAA would something like that be the goal for collegiate pickleball to make it just like any other varsity sport, or do you see it sort of continuing to stay in private hands of uh you know companies like the Hub and Pickleball Superstore to sponsor teams? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I, I ultimately think um, you know it's 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 challenging. So how collegiate sports work? I'm sure you know going to Michigan. Um, basically, you know, Michigan football makes money. Michigan basketball probably does. And that's about it. And then, um, the the rest of them don't make money and hence title nine, which is fantastic, which basically allowed, uh, women's sports to basically get equal funding. Um, and so whatever the, the football team required, um, for funding that got divvied up between the rest of the of the women's sports on title nine so that's why you'll see more nc2a women's sports than you do men's sports um and but but the ones that really make money are essentially football and a little bit of basketball and so um so the challenge will be um the money right where does the money come from if it were to be an nc2a sport um it may come and it may be there from a club level for sure um at club level for sure the 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 trick to it will be how does the club stay funded right it can be funded by the students but students don't have any money 
And, um, but it can be funded by companies like Pickleball Superstore is a great one and like clubs like the hub is a, is a great one. And so with support of the, of business, right? Um, that's really what will start to lend itself to, um, you know, the, the support of these clubs um, out there. And, and I believe they'll get a ton of support because the collegiate market's very powerful when it comes to brand development and um, embedding a brand at that early stage level um, for a, whether it's a paddle or a ball or, a, you know, again, an e-commerce platform like Pickleball Superstore or whatever it is, if, if we, it's, it's like, again, I, I got to catch myself in your age, but I bet the grade school you went to, you probably had Apple computers in your grade school. Or did you have Apple computers in your grade school? Yeah, I, I think we had, I think we had Chromebooks or something. Okay. Yeah, uh, comparable, same thing. Yeah. So it started, you know, before your time, but when Apple computer, their marketing was to basically go out and, and fund all the schools at the grade school level, Apple computers. And so mm -hmm. what it did for Apple was that it embedded their brand and their technology at an early, early age. So then all these kids, right. as they continue to grow up and become adults, they stuck with Apple as the brand because that's what they were used to and and they supported it, right? And then then Chrome got in and you know Google and you know everybody else you know saw that and saw how well it worked. So that concept, like I don't know if it'll become an NCAA two sport or, or not because it's again it's a money driven thing, but it will be supported uh, athletic, you know will be supported and whether people will be able to get scholarships to it and all that kind of stuff time will tell um that's where the challenge comes in but certainly it'll be supported by business because business wants to support that okay that, that's such an interesting point you made too about uh even like the apple computers i'm almost thinking that obviously if you know making the money outright j just to like support it that wouldn't make sense but almost, you're right, we don't have high school pickleball or middle school pickleball or elementary school pickleball yet. Those aren't, those aren't even. It's in, coming. You know, right. But once they do, maybe, you know, then the scholar, then obviously there would be more of a scholarship. Well, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So you, you think, you think it'll sort of happen organically as this, as the sport sort of like just. Yeah, for sure. It'll, it, it definitely will. I mean, you know, realistically, It'll end up in the Olympics. It probably won't end up until 2032. Um, people would probably want it earlier in 28, but probably not. Probably 2032 would be my guess because of all the requirements that it has to get get through to get there. You know, once that, you know, as that continues to grow and as that continues to push, um, I, I think you'll all, you, you could potentially see it at the NC2A sport level for sure. Um, you know, the, when you wrap in NC2A, it becomes an issue of funding again. And and, and that's when, you know, scholarships and, and other things start to, to help to get you in the school and to, to help the funding of it, you know, of your education, everything else. And that, and that that'll be interesting to see if that's going to happen or not. And that, that's a tough one. Do you, do you think that if like the sport, you know, being brought into the Olympics, would that bring a lot more money in oh of course country. okay and then and then yeah maybe, maybe that would you know incentivize college right and, and that's kind of my point right so as, as you get more of this going at an in international level and and even having now all these collegiate national championships and you know everything else it's you're you're seeing this trend and this acceleration going so fast it's it's unbelievable i mean um i would venture to guess you know, in the last, you know, you probably weren't playing pickleball three years ago or really knew what it was. Right. Um, I had probably just found out about it and just hit around a couple of times. Yeah. Right. And it, certainly there wasn't a club at Michigan at that point in time. And I would venture to guess your club at Michigan was a year old or yeah, two. It was, it, there was one, but it was, you're right. It was very, you know, disorganized and the people right. were, it, it didn't look like the pickleball you play now. I, I, I played a tournament like two and a half years ago, just like signed up and I went in as like a tennis player who'd never really played pickleball. And I walked in and I just smoked everybody. And I was like, oh, this is, 
I signed up for a tournament again, the same one, a couple of years later. The sport's completely different. Right. You go, I, I could not just tennis my way through it. Um, so, yeah, right. as a, you see, like, pickleball become more of its own sport um, and sort of separate from the others. Yeah, you'll see that community grow on its own. And think about what you just said, Elliot, and think about the position that you are in now and your other um, you know, peers that are in college and the opportunities that that can bring you because you're at the forefront of an in, in industry and in a sport that um, you you think it's blown up now. It, it's, it hasn't even started. It's going to go crazy. <laughs> and then when your kids are going to Michigan, you're like, Dad, you were part of the pickleball club? Yeah, I was the founding member. You know I mean? It's like, they're going to go, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, so I mean, honestly the opportunities um, are, you know, continue to be, you know, phenomenal out there. Right. Do, do you see any avenues right now that pickleball still has yet to be capitalized on, or I don't know, any sort of pickleball path still to be trailblazed? I think there's a ton of avenues. I think, you know, being creative um, and, and you don't always have to do, come up with a unique and different idea and be totally different. You can take an existing idea and, and improve on it too. Don't, don't think, you know, I know you're in college and, you know, it's, it's not acceptable to cheat, but you know, in, in the real world, feel free to cheat. So, you know, if you take someone else's idea and look at it and say, well, boy, why did they do it like that? If you tweak a, B and C, that would be a much better business model. Like that's okay. You know, you can you can do that. Um, but there's a ton of opportunities. I mean, if you look at, you know, clothing, for example, that you know, there's there's a lot of companies trying to get into the clothing space on this. Um, but a lot of it was just all this cutesy stuff in the beginning and you know, with little pickleballs on it or paddles and stuff like that. Well, my wife would never wear that, <laughs> you know. So um you know, so it's, there's a lot of different tastes. There's a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's, you know, the club business in and of itself with the hub. You know, one of the major things that are missing are courts um, and, and having the clubs, right? Like you said, in Michigan, you're you're going 20 minutes out to go to your courts. So, you know, the challenge of that is that that's very capital intensive. Um, but there's money out there for good ideas and, and doing the work and, and everything else. But, you know, the real estate side of this equation, that's what I like a lot of, about the hub and what we're doing. It's, it's, a, it's a big real estate play and then organizing and running the clubs efficiently and effectively. I like controlling the courts. I like controlling, you know, having that business around that and, and doing that. Um, there's a lot of people out there that... Um, are running tournaments, for example, that you know come in and rent courts or whatever. Um, so there's there's that business is out there and there's quite a bit. Um, if you own the courts, you're going to be in a much better position on that. Um, basically, uh, you know that and products. Um, you know the barrier of entry on paddles are relatively low. Um, you can get them produced relatively low, and you have smart engineers and guys there and figure out manufacturing to be able to produce it. Um, that you know what we like or what I like is um, this the distribution of that and that's where pickleball superstore comes in so we don't make a paddle but you know or any other product for that matter but we distribute 2400 products right so we carry and distribute a lot of products out there and, and that's our brand and and so it's like going to Amazon right so it's like Amazon doesn't make the trash bag but you can go on Amazon and buy a trash bag right so same same deal. We just are a specialized store where Amazon's not going to carry all the specialized pickleball paddles, which once you get past the beginner level, you're going to really want to dig down on what exactly what type of paddle you want. So there's a need for a pickleball superstore and the distribution side of it. Um, but it goes on and on. I mean, there's again, back to this trade show that you mentioned, um, you know, you would you would have seen a lot of different, um, you know, problems being solved, a lot of different companies, a lot of different, you know, concepts of, you know, people out there trying to be entrepreneurs and figure out, you know, a business um, around pickleball, basically. Yeah, and it, it is it is interesting that, you know, at the convention, you mentioned 
you know, how as, as a successful business mind, you know, you saw sort of some ideas around there or, you know, projects people working on that you didn't know if you'd probably invest it personally yourself. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting that, the, you know, the hub and the pickleball superstore, it's everything but sort of making a paddle, which seems to be what everyone's doing. Right. Um, and is that, are, are you sort of seeing that like probably half of these paddle companies are kaput in like five, 10 years, or is the sport big enough that it really can sustain that much innovation and just slight difference in paddle? The paddle business, let's talk about the paddle business for a second. There's some really smart, innovative people out there and, and everything else. They are restricted at some level on the guidelines of what, of what a paddle is to be approved by USA Pickleball. Mm -hmm. um, and soon the UPA, but um, so th there's parameters and there's some level of restriction to what you can do in general. But the problem more is for all these people that are coming in and literally at Pickleball Superstore, I bet we have a stack of 500 different brands of paddles that, that we don't carry, by the way, like unbelievable wow. amount that, that are stacked up in the office that basically people ship them to us saying, hey, we'd like you to, you know, distribute our product, right? Because we become their marketing arm, for lack of a better term. We have a huge database. We have a huge reach. You know, it's a pretty big e-commerce platform. And so the problem is um, these panel companies that it's a relatively low, low barrier of entry to produce it because you can go to on Alibaba and go into China and email them and say, hey, make me this paddle, this shape, do this, do this. And they'd be happy to do it for you and relatively small quantities and ship it in. And there you go. And you made yourself a brand and that's fun and it's all great. Now, how do you sell it? <laughs> right? right. So that's where the problem comes in for most of these people is the marketing and distribution side of the business. And so I see a lot of these companies are going to fail because they just won't be able to sell it through. And, you know, and it's hard to get the top level pros. And is there a lot of value in, you know, getting a top level pro to, to put their name on a paddle and, and, and do all that? And at what cost? And then once you do that, what does the rest of your marketing look like? And, you know, how many, you know, clubs are you in and how many demos can you do? And, and again, you need to be in a big e-commerce platform like Pickleball Super sort of to, to work with them to help market and brand your paddle and push your brand out. Otherwise, how do you push your brand? How do you know to buy that brand of paddle? Um, what paddle do you use, Elliot? I use a, it's a smaller brand. It's called a 2044, but it was the brand that sponsored our, our Michigan team. So everyone well, on the team has them. Yeah. And see, this is my point. And this is the point of back to Apple computer and that story back to where the power of, of the university, that company, whoever they are, they are very smart because what they did was they said, we will sponsor you and we'll give you paddles and here's your brand. And you're like, great, this is a good paddle. Cause I'm sure it's a great paddle. It's not like all these other brands don't make good paddles, but they were smart to put that brand in your hand because now you became their ambassador or advocate of the paddle and they're sponsoring and that's very inexpensive advertisement for that brand. They're, that's a very smart brand. Whoever's behind that brand is thinking, um, in which I which I appreciate the thought process. So it was exactly my Apple story, right? And and that's yeah. and back to the power of your club at Michigan and these other clubs, you can go shop that. You can say, hey, look, you know, we're we travel to X amount of tournaments, we have X amount of people in our club, we do this, we do that, we need, we'd like to have. X, Y, and Z, um, we need uniforms, we need travel expense, we need paddles, we need this. Will you sponsor us? You know, no, we can't do it at that level. Okay, let me go talk to the next guy. Um, you know, so you have strength in your brand that you're building. Your club at Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, is a little business and you got to think of it that way. And you guys have some, some strength. So what can you do to help generate, um, you know, money for your business, essentially. And and your your goals of your business isn't necessarily to make money, it's to cover costs. So, so your students aren't, you know, kicking in dollars and hopefully there's money to, to have your team travel to go to the tournaments and, 
you know, and you get the equipment for free and maybe a uniform for free and that kind of stuff. I mean, th those would be, you know, realistic goals for the, the club to set basically, but, but that, but that's the point. Oh yeah. And I, I totally describe our club in the, in the stages it is right now, like a little bit of a business, like, you know, we, we made merch and sold it to be able to pay to play at the courts. Um, so yeah, just sort of like self-funding our own stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll probably... well, and, and the courts, I'll just bring up that example. Here at the Hub, what we do is we um, we give San Diego State, they're going to get a shirt that says San Diego State Aztec Pickleball Club, you know, in the home of the Hub on it, branded shirt, the whole right. deal. And we give it to all the members, basically. And then we let them... Um, practice for free and we do it during you know off hours with their students and they can come midday when the club's relatively empty a couple of days a week for free if they want to join the club to, to play you know outside of their practice hours we discount that but basically you know there's no cost to the school or, or your club to come in and use our courts the advantage that we get as the hub is that we basically have shirts that we paid for that have the hub logo on it that all these kids are walking around San Diego state, which is four miles from our club, you know, showing the hub logo. And when they go play, they're like, well, let's go to the hub. Right. So there's the club that you're currently playing at. You should go pitch that model to them and say, we want you to sponsor us. And here's what we want you to do. And if they were smart, they'd go, wow, that would bring a lot of value to us. Um, and that would bring marketing. So to market into the university, which is what they really would, you know, should consider doing and investing into your club, basically. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. No, I'm I'm like noting this, you know, I, I should write this down or something. Well, you got it on video. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Good point. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of opportunity in business and in when you start thinking like an entrepreneur, you'll look at everything different. It's a curse, by the way. I don't wish it on anybody. But, you know, we're talking about pickleball, but I just broke down five different business scenarios that that you can do at any level. Um, you know, and so when you start looking at different you know problems, figure out solutions. And, those, and that's the first step of being an entrepreneur, identifying a problem and identifying a solution to the problem. And usually it's wrapped around money and business and, and then it expands from there. Yeah, and, and hearing that, um, do you see the hub as something that you're gonna expand? I know you're in the process of developing a fourth location, um, but they're all more along the West Coast, correct? No, the, our four, we have three, um, we're the largest on, on in California. We have three very large locations in California. Our fourth one is in Jacksonville, Florida. So it's okay. on the totally other side, other side of the world. So uh, one of my partners moved there, Ted Angelo, great guy and a uh, great builder. And he's going to go build um, build our fourth location in Jacksonville. Um, so it's we're, we're excited about that and the whole thing. And, and we'll see where the hub um, goes. The, we're privately held. We, you know, we own it. Um, and um most of these clubs that are going like um they're franchisees which there's value to that um to me it doesn't make a ton of sense but but there's value in you know being a franchisee you know and getting one of these brands and you know letting them teach you their secret sauce and but it, at the end of the day they're you're still renting a building or buying land or a building and you're still investing your money and you're putting it together and you're still doing all the stuff yourself and operating it and then you're paying for the franchisee. You're paying about eight percent of your revenue goes back to the franchisor. So it can make sense in my world. I I don't like that model as much. And and we self fund them, so we're not looking for money, and we just do them ourselves. So what we what we own, we actually own, and we own the brand and the whole thing. Yeah, and, and we'll probably build more. I mean, the odds are we will, and we'll get into different partnerships and figure out other things. Um, it, I don't know if it'll be a straight franchise model, probably more partnership type of deals and investments and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it, it's pretty clear that you guys, you know, don't intend on 
like letting up you've got sort of your your hands in in pretty much every second you, you said that you've got like part of a team as well as like the store and the hub everything but paddles but that seems to probably be the good move but yeah, well <laughs> you know we'll see if we get in the paddle business or not i mean we're looking at it um you know we um I, I don't own part of a team, but we own part of Major League Pickleball. Um, but the hub in San Diego is the home of Major League Pickleball's um, Hard Eights, SoCal Hard Eights, and the hub in in San Francisco area on Alameda is the home of the Barrier Breakers. And so we do this NorCal versus SoCal rivalry thing, and that's very oh, cool. fun. So we're very tied in with you know with the teams at the, at the pro level. We're going to be doing the same at the collegiate level. So um, have the different colleges that we that we sponsor basically battle it out and do that kind of fun stuff um, um, again the paddle business you know does make a lot of sense we've been very focused on you know building the distribution um, model to it um, which is um, you know really you need that distribution model um, to get the product out there and, you know, and everything else. And so we're less specific about any one brand as much as, because the brands, as you probably see, they turn so much, right? And there's new technology and a new color and a new this and a new that. So what was hot six months ago as a paddle and the end paddle is now there's three others out there, right? So, so we would rather just be on that distribution sales end of it than you know trying to keep coming up with something new and innovative and you know all the other things so um but it's but it's all good it's just where you want to be at the end of the day right awesome sweet well yeah i think we're all very excited to see where the hub and pickleball superstore go you know if it's if it's stamped with the rolfus approval i'll I, I believe in it succeeding. So, you know, I, well, I appreciate that, that Elliot, but I want to, I want to be real clear, you know, the, my partners, Ted Angelo, Ken Tran, and you now Rick Chan, uh, they're really smart, hardworking guys too, uh, really connected. So believe me, this is not the Pat Rolfa show, but I appreciate, um, you know, what I bring to the table on this is, but, but everybody does. We we're, we're all, in sync and on the same page of how to build our businesses. They're, they're real businesses with real investments and real dollars. And, and it's real fun. I mean, yeah. when you do it right and you have the opportunity in this particular space is um, it's work and it's hard, but it's, it does bring a lot of joy and it's, and it's fun to do for sure. Yeah. Right on. I'm, I'm glad, especially considering this is, this is considered your like semi retirement is still going on and doing interviews so yeah, yeah which 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 i actually am enjoying this as well and i do need to make one comment on steve rack steve rack is our ceo at um pickleball superstore and just a, a brilliant man um has technology so you know to help your club you know grow and and generate more revenue you should work with pickleball superstore because you'll you'll make revenue off of basically you know the products that we sell, which is key, right? That's the value of Pickleball Superstore is that we have a revenue generating model. All, all the businesses do, obviously, but but Pickleball Superstore is selling product. It generates revenue, and we share that revenue, which is which is great from a club aspect. So working with us there is great, and and really that's my partner Steve Rack, who you know really is the driving force behind the technology as well as the company. So you know, kudos to him. Kudos to me to, to basically partner with him. And I should say it that way because he works his ass off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kudos to all you guys. You guys are really making it happen. And, you know, again, we're excited to see where it goes. But thank you so much for taking the time out of the day to, you know, join me for this this little sit down. This was awesome. Yeah, Elliot, super fun, man. And, and good luck to you. And anything I can do to to help you and your team, I'm, I'm all about it. I'll give way too sweet. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, have a great day. You too.